little different than how we usually do things. Uh, all the other webinars that I've done are webinars, so usually you only see me, and I yap for about an hour, um, but this is a little different because, excuse me, we set it up as a Zoom so that we could have conversation, okay? And I did that because, as you know, the topic is tips and tricks for spring gardening, and um, I prepared this set of slides you're going to see, but um, I consider myself to be a novice gardener, which is why I invited Jill from the OSU Portage County Extension and the Master Gardeners. So Lori Babby was kind enough to accept that invitation and uh, um, come on and talk for uh, about a couple of things that she's interested in. But I know the rest of you, if you're interested in gardening, unless you're just starting out Right now, you probably have tips and tricks to share with us. So I would encourage you, whenever you want, to just speak up. Now I'll say my little bit of stuff for each slide, and then you guys comment and share. I have my notepad here so that I can write down, and then if we want at the end, I can just share that in an email so that everyone gets the information that we're sharing. Because I want this to be more of a collaborative online meeting, I guess. Are we okay with that? And Al and Debbie Barber are master gardeners too, so. Oh, perfect. Good. All right. Welcome, Al and Debbie. I'm glad you guys are on here. So hopefully you guys are willing to share some things as well. Okay. Um, well, let's just get started that way. How, if you're willing to share, how, how would you rate yourself as a gardener? And if you don't want to say it out loud, you can add it in the chat. I think I've enabled that. So and just go ahead and start Who, whoever wants to start. What's your experience gardening? What kind of gardening do you do? What, what are your interests? Well, George told me I should join this because I need to learn how to keep plants alive. Oh. <laughs> so I'd say my experience is not very great. <laughs> okay, thanks George. <laughs> are they indoor plants or outdoor plants? Outdoor. Okay, okay, I get Oh, that. I gave up on indoor. Oh yeah, I have no love with indoor plants. <laughs> um, I don't see anything in the chat yet. Maybe some of you are there. Uh, Debbie, if you do, you feel comfortable sharing? How much do you? Uh, well, I've been at it a few years, but I'm not very good. Okay. I plant vegetables and some flowers, and I get some things growing pretty good, and other things. There to four. Good. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? This is Debbie Barber. Um, Al's not here right now. He's out looking for goose nests. Okay. But um, <laughs> I will. I will step in for both of us. We have um, a decent sized vegetable garden. In fact, just today we planted sugar snap peas, um, and we have. A bit of fruit. We have uh, strawberries and red raspberries and black raspberries and blackberries and grapes. I think that's probably and and some apples and cherries. So we do we do that. And then I really um, love to to play with herbs and uh, pollinators and natives. So I have what I call my jungle mm -hmm. uh, that has a lot of those in it. But um, I personally focus on what's going to bring in the pollinators and, um, you know, keep keep everything alive. And we just, Al just sowed a bunch of um, um, clover seed in the yard. So I guess we're going to be turning our grass into more clover. I'm not sure that remains to be seen. Okay. But we, we have a jungle and we grow a lot of things. Wonderful. I've seen that um, that clover yard is trending more than I've seen in previous years. People are getting rid of their grass and intentionally put um, putting clover down. So right. I'm I interested grow. to see how that goes. Did was someone else going to say something on that? I said I think it's uh, micro clover that's being planted. Um, mm -hmm. We do have some in our yard, a small amount or an area that was reseeded about two years ago, and it definitely attracts more pollinators. Good. Good. That makes a lot of sense. And I like the way it looks better with its little flowers. I'm looking you at mo Do you mow the clover the way you do grass or just let it grow? Yeah, you mow it. Mow it. 
the videos that I've seen, they use those push mowers, the manual ones, um, but they had a very small yard. So I don't know. What's your what's your plan, Debbie? Are you going to use a regular we, mower? We mow, um, but we mow high. Yeah. Um, we don't really manicure a yard. We would never fit in a normal housing development. <laughs> they would throw us out quickly. Uh, but we do mow high because um, we think it's good it's good for the grass and it's good good for the environment. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, so we'll start moving through this. Um, again, like I said, I'll pause at each one. You let me know um, what questions or what comments you want to share there. So if you've been on the webinars before, you know I always start right here. Um, if you're on here, you're probably already getting our newsletter, but I did want to pause so that you can have access to that QR code. If you don't use QR codes, you can just go to portageparkdistrict.org, but that will take you directly to sign up for our newsletter, where you will get um, the newsletter the first Thursday of every month, which has all of the, the park information, what's going on, um, the highlights of the education programs. So it's really the first place um, for you to get your information. And I do want to share our mission as always. Uh, because it's the cornerstone of everything we do, starting with that word conserve, um, which I think Debbie mentioned too, but we want to conserve Portage County's natural heritage and provide opportunities for its appreciation and enjoyment. So we work hard to make Portage County look like Portage County, and then the education team, um, we strive to give you opportunities to appreciate and enjoyment. This one's a little different because we want you to appreciate and enjoy it in your own yard and make your own little haven. So we're going to be sharing that way. Okay, so the first thing, and I do have to give credit, I don't know where Jill is, but she gave me a lot of ideas that have been put into this uh, PowerPoint. So I do wanna give Jill credit, but first we wanna get prepped. So I don't know about you, but at the end of some seasons, you feel like it's over with, but the work you put in then really makes the next season so much easier. So it's kind of late now, but maybe it's something we can think about going into this new season. But we really want to get prepped. So organize and look over your tools. Do you need anything new or replaced? Do you need to add anything to your collection? I don't know if anyone's super nerdy and gets excited about the garden tools you're using, but um, I know I get excited every time I bring my garden bag back out for the season. Um, and then you want to clean, sharpen, and oil your tools if that's what they're needed. Um, hopefully we put our, our tools away clean, but we know there's always stray uh, dirt or soil on them. And then sharpen them. And then if they need oil to make sure that helps um, reduce the amount of corrosion, because you know we're going to be in the water and the mud, and we want them to last as long as possible. And like with everything, the good tools are what's helpful. And I do believe... Um, the master gardeners and those of you who are master gardeners can tell me you're you're offering tool sharpening Mother's Day weekend. Is that accurate? I have a plant sale on Mother's Day weekend. Okay. I don't know if they'll there will be tool sharpening there or not. Okay. Um, so that was from an email from Jill. So it. Yes. I do need, yeah, and Wanda needs a cleaner tools too. We do, Wanda. Um, so the Master Gardeners will be having a plant sale Mother's Day weekend and uh, supposedly <laughs> sharpening your tools there too. So there's an option if you don't want to do that yourself. And then, of course, um, check your supplies. What do you need to kind of re-up on before you go and get your hands in the dirt? So do you have enough compost? Do you have enough fill dirt? I know for me particularly, um, three years ago, maybe four years ago now, we put in six raised garden beds. And you can tell over time that the soil has begun to sink. So I'm gonna have to fill those in a little bit as they've settled and then um, add some soil amendments in there as well, right? Uh, Rhonda's asking where the plant sale is. Lori, do you have information? Um, sure, it starts at 9 a.m. It's on the Saturday before Mother's Day. I don't have my calendar in front of me, but it it's will be- it's May on the 11th, 11th Lori. <laughs> 11th, okay. It's Jesus. located at the Portage County Soil and Water Conservation District office outside in their parking lot. On That's on State Route 88. Um, oh. It's somewhat across the street from the Joint Vocational School. Maplewood? Maplewood, yes. Um, and it starts at 9 o'clock until we run out of plants. <laughs> Do you know what kind of things you're offering? Oh, yeah. 
Um, we offer annuals. We offer a lot of vegetables, herbs. A lot of the plants come from the gardens, the home gardens of the master gardeners. So we try to have as many native plants, op plant options for folks as we can. Um, we have a trash to treasure sale in the back of the building in the big room at Soil and Water, which is like a rummage sale for gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's got a lot of nice things, but as far as plants, we have, we usually have shrubs, um, house plants, shrubs, um, what am I missing, Debbie? Hanging baskets. Hanging baskets, yes, a wonderful yeah. array of hanging baskets. Beautiful gifts for Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. Is this the one that used to be an Ode to Joy? No. 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 That's a different group. That's the Kent Garden Club where the Master Garden, Portage County Master Garden. Oh, oh okay. There's a lot of overlap, but it's, yeah. it's different. Okay. So the one at Ode to Joy is at the end of the month. No, their yeah. hanging basket sale is that same weekend. And then their big sale is oh. uh, Memorial Day weekend. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Have to come to the soil and water district. Right. Perfect. Okay. I tried to type everything that they just said and I did throw it in the in the chat box in case you missed any of that. Okay. Um and then check if you I think I said that compost and fill dirt, which I definitely know that I'm gonna have to. Does anyone have any tips on just getting prepped? Does anyone have tips on sharpening or other things that you should um, make sure you grab. The point of this slide is to say, you know, you go out and you want to start gardening and then you're like, oh shoot, I forgot this. Oh shoot, I forgot that. So anything that I, you know you need to have ready to go before you can start? I would have, if you like to mark your plants so that you know what you planted, mm -hmm. I would make sure you have all of those supplies ready to go also. Okay. Wonderful. Plant markers. Good tip. Anyone else want to share? Okay. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. Okay. So clean it up and fill it in. So um, I know if you go out and you didn't cover your garden beds, it's likely that with the that funny weather we had in the late winter, you're going to have some sort of weeds because they had a good opportunity to start growing. So you want to get rid of as much old plant material and take out the weeds. Um, weeds you can kind of do what you want with them, right? As long as they don't remain in your in your flower beds or your garden, your vegetable garden beds. So um, some suggest that you burn them. Some suggest you put them in the compost as long as you put them in the middle so it gets hot enough to truly kill them. Um, I have a place in my woods where I just uh, dump all of my plant material and it seems to be fine because it's out in the woods. Um, and then when we're removing old plant material, I don't know about you, but some of my tomatoes at the end of the season that just fall off, I kind of just let them fall in the soil where they lie. And mm -hmm. then if they oh, have degraded enough over the season, I just turn it over with that material in there. Oh. And yes, it does give me a, a few bonus tomatoes that pop up, I don't know, uh, out of the soil, uh, but at least it, all those nutrients have been returned and I don't have to worry about removing it because we just made our own compost right there in the soil. Mm -hmm. And then my other suggestion would be, if you do want compost and you don't have the opportunity to compost in your own yard, is to look into free composting offered by your city. So if you live in Ravenna or Ravenna Township, um, I know they give a mulch giveaway and I did just call them this morning and they are doing it again starting in March. So you can go on the city of Ravenna's website and look at their calendar and um, they'll tell you exactly when the mulch giveaways will be. So. Does One thing I would say, if you're going to leave any plant material in your garden, you want to be 100% sure that it does not have any um, insects or bacteria or fungus on it. It's got to be really clean if you're going to leave it in there. Yeah, good. So th that's a good point to make, especially um, in our, like our potted plants, right? So Jill suggested that um, with those, you wash them in a bleach solution to get rid of any fungus or um, other things that you don't want carrying from season to season. So you can do that as well. Um, it might be a little bit different with raised beds, right? That seems like a lot of soil to turn over, but if you notice that it's causing an issue with the plants as they go through the season, then it might be time to change it up. 
Anyone what about to... with leaves? The what? Leaves. The leaves? Yeah. So um, I don't know how we, the, my, I, I should preface this by saying I'm not a best gardener. Um, I just dilly dally in the yard. <laughs> um, but I um, do leave some leaves. Um, I do have a bunch of uh, different trees in my yard. Um, and they naturally fall. So if they happen to fall in the garden beds and they're able to break down enough, I'll break it down in the soil when I turn it over. What's okay. the master garden opinion? If the leaves are in your yard and you're mowing and mulching the leaves, you know, it's fine to leave them in the grass. Mm -hmm. um, you want to be careful about putting them. I leave Leaf compost is great. Leaf mulch is great. Just make sure you're not smothering anything when you put it on your garden, it's better if it's broken up and, and degraded a little bit, at least before you put it on. And it depends on, um, a lot of us don't, a lot of us use a no-till philosophy, so we may not be turning the dirt over in our garden. So if it's would be fine to put leaves, say on a raised bed or on a garden, but you'd probably want to remove those in the spring. Otherwise, you smother some things. Okay, thank you. The, the other thing I might mention about leaves, um, some don't break down very well. They don't decompose well. Um, I know Norway maples are one of those trees. Those leaves just, they, they just don't go away. Um, so I like having leaf debris as long as, you know, it's healthy leaf debris and kind of breaks down. But if it doesn't, I think you want to clear it away. Mm -hmm. Or black walnut trees. Black walnut trees are very acidic. Yeah. And if planted near one isn't going to do well. Um, so I try to, and I have a black walnut tree near my raised beds. So I try to clear those leaves out and any debris from that tree I take out of my raised beds. Good to know. Good. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Okay. So preparing the soil, and this conversation was kind of alluded to on the last slide about to break up or not to break up the soil, right? Um, so we can see we're moving into this era, or we have been for a while, of the whole no-till concept. So um, do you ladies want to speak a little bit more to what that is and what that means and why we do it now? Well, no-till means... You know, when, when people think about tilling, they think about taking that big tiller out to till up the rows of your garden. When you're doing that, you are actually, you know, you're bringing weed seeds up to the surface that are going to sprout. You are harming the soil, actually, the physical construction of the soil, and you're losing nitrogen that's in the soil. So the Thinking the science is that the less you can till that soil or the less you can disturb your soil, the better. So it's fine to maybe make a little crevice or a row, a tiny row to put your seed in. Um, a lot of us try not to even till at all. Sometimes you have to. If it's, for example, we have a field, six acres of field, and there was a spot we decided to put a garden in. That field hadn't been touched in a long time, and we really had to till the rows to to loosen it up enough to even be able to do anything, to even amend it, to plant things. So there are times when you have to do that. But would I do it every year? No, I would not. You know, you can mow weeds down. You can. There are a lot of ways not to have to till. I, you just have to keep in mind that every time you till, you're losing. Nu nutrients you're damaging that the body of the soil and the soil is very important for the nutrition of what you're growing in there mm -hmm. i'd like to just just add to that um somebody was talking about pulling plants out or something earlier um some thinking now is don't pull out plants by the roots, like tomatoes, for example, you know, you clean up in the fall and you pull out all your tomatoes and your peppers and whatever. But the thinking is don't do that. Cut them off at the ground and leave the roots in the soil. 
And that helps enrich the soil. It helps break up the soil and it provides nutrients that you need as well. So again, a reason not to till, you've got that good stuff in there. Um, you just want to plant around it, plant in it and keep it. You know, you don't, you don't need to um, manicure it, I guess. Mm. Wonderful. It's kind of the same thinking when you're using a cover crop. I use cover crops on my raised beds. Mm -hmm. And now those, for example, if they don't die off in the wintertime, I might have to turn those over into the soil and try to do as little as possible. But you know, I don't pull anything out. I leave everything there so that it dies and all that organic matter stays in my soil. And it really helps a lot. Okay, smart. I know there's been conversations about not just at the local level, but they're trying to get these farmers who have thousands upon thousands of acres and those huge farms to do this no-tell method and to change that that thinking that's been prevalent for so long. But there are farms out west that are really seeing the benefit of this and mm -hmm. changing. So, and then another negative of it is that it's found that when you till, you're actually releasing carbon from the soil, which um, you know is a is a greenhouse gas when it becomes carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. So we're helping a lot of things by reducing our soil. Um, well, what do you what do you do then if you have to add soil to the garden because everything's so compacted and so hard? Do you not till that in that new soil? I think what Lori was saying, if it is so hard and you don't really have a choice, then you can break it up. Yeah. But if you're going to add soil on top of it, maybe that could act as like your base layer and you're adding new soil on top of it. What do you ladies think? Are you talking about a um, a garden, like an in the ground garden? You no, I'm talking about a raised bed. Raised bed? Okay. Gosh, and your soil's really hard. Yeah, I haven't done anything with the garden for two years, so <laughs> it's in sad shape. <laughs> um, I might add some soil to the top and work that soil in uh -huh. with a hoe or a rake or something. And then this fall, I would plant a cover crop on that raised bed and keep doing that every fall. And uh, you'll see a difference. I... Last year, I wasn't able to put one on, um, but cover crops just keep that loose and just full of nutrition. I can't say enough about cover crops. But Lori, really, what would you recommend? Um, what What would you recommend for the cover crop? Cover crops. Well, I bought a mixture that was made specifically for a raised bed, but there are. Um, Cover crops are usually different legumes, uh, which is they add nitrogen to the soil. Um, grasses and grains, um, things like oats or sorghum, brassicas, um, broadleaf plants like flax or buck, buckwheat. There are, I've got some resources I'll put in the chat where you can buy cover crop seeds and also uh, places where you can look for more information because it depends on where you're going to do it. If you have a garden in a big field, you might purchase something different than what I would put on my raised beds. Okay. And you're going to talk a little bit more about cover crops later, right? Um, I can okay. if people are interested. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Lori is my go-to for, you know, raised beds, she knows how the soil gets compacted easily, like because it doesn't have that natural breakdown. But I think Lori's suggestions are, are the best ones I've heard. Is that you, Jill Halligan? <laughs> it is Jill Halligan, whose camera is not working. So oh, that's okay. Hi. Just draw a picture of me and we'll go <laughs> Okay, so we'll pause uh, right there to introduce um, the, the Jill with the, the gray background. That's Jill Halligan. She's our OSU Extension representative. Jill, what's your actual title? I am a program assistant with 4-H, but as you know, I am also an OCVN and have, we have worked together on several projects of yeah. uh, wildlife and wildflowers and doing right. some things like that. Yeah. So Jill's my go-to in the OSU office, so I like doing programs like this with her. Um, 
when it said yeah and it's great to see so many of our master gardeners on here tonight too because these are the people who keep getting osu education continually every year finding new and updated ways of doing things so that they are up to date on the new trends in gardening yeah and it shows i've already learned a lot so far <laughs> right <laughs> okay where let me check the chat i think we have a question Oh, Lori put um, resources in there yep. for soil health. Yep. Okay. yep. Great. Excellent. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess, um, where'd you go? Jane, with with my raised beds, I have that, that three-prong tool, like the little hand hoe, and I just mm -hmm. go and I break the soil up at the top because sometimes mine, it's, when it sits, it gets really hard too if I haven't amended it in a while. So. Oh, okay. That's kind of what I've... I've done. Now, am I assuming you're just talking vegetable gardens? Or are you doing flower? Is this applicable to I flowers as everything well? Everything is kind of in general. And then if we want to get more basic, then we can just ask ask those right. questions as they come along. Yeah. Yeah. But this yeah. is more of a generalized presentation. Oh, okay. Because yes. I do more flowers. I have better luck with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's my passion, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> perennials. Only perennials. <laughs> yes. Um, Okay, so then you could uh, add a soil amendments, and then if you don't know what soil amendments you need, you can consider getting a soil test. And Jill, am I correct in saying that OSU does the soil test or sends out the soil tests? We send them out. Uh, you can buy a soil test for $15 at our office, and we ship them out to, I believe it's Penn State that we actually commissioned to do that. And they'll run an analysis for you and then send it back to you. You can always if you don't understand your results, you can always call our office and set up something with Seth. Seth is the A&R, the Agricultural Natural Resource Guy, and uh, he can walk you through it and show you what um, your results mean. And you do this this tool that's on the left-hand side, you, you have that to borrow in your office too, right? We do. We do have that one. Uh, that's for taking the soil test, and, uh, and I don't think there's directions on how to use it, but... Um, <laughs> We do yes, have one like in the office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then you don't have to have one to do a soil test either. You can you can always use your spade and dig down. You know, like from the four different corners of of you know where you want to go. But the soil kit has all the directions in there. Provides the bag for shipping, all of it. So okay, it'll help you. It'll help. And again, you can get um, compost. Uh, and mulch from maybe your local city, uh, but you can always compost in your own yard. So um, a couple of years ago, we put up, we just made a little half box out of pallets and then all of my garden scraps and kitchen scraps, uh, and eggshells, they all go in there and you turn it over every once in a while and then you just wait till it's broken down enough and you can use that right on top of your, your garden and mix it and make your own soil amendment. Does anyone else have experience with with composting, Wanda compost too. Cool. Yeah. Right. I use Good. a compost yeah. tumbler because um, I'm too lazy to <laughs> turn it by hand. Yeah. You can't make as much, but it makes great compost. Right. Yeah. That's what I have too. Is the tumbler. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those are nice, and you can get those. Those are affordable, and they're small enough that you can just tumble. You know, your table scraps. Yeah. I have seen that they have a small one now that you can actually keep on your kitchen countertop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that was really nice too. But if you do have a space and you do want to have a compost pile, you, there's two different ways of composting. You can do a hot pile or a cold pile. And the hot pile is one where you put your your brown layer, you know, that's your your leaves and your dead things, and then your green pile, which would be more like um like table scraps or grass cuttings, that type of stuff. And you layer it in there and you keep turning it. Uh, you don't add to it daily. You just, uh, once everything's in there, you start turning it. But the cold the cold way is where you can add to it every day, but you don't have to turn it. And it takes a little bit longer for everything to break down. But both of them, very doable. Even if you left the pile of leaves in the woods, like I often do, they break down and turn into some nice compost after only like a year or two. Hmm. I've never heard of cold composting. That's cool. Um, in in ours, 
I'm glad you brought up that the tumblers because I have that pallet box out near the wood line, but that's not really accessible when we have snow, not that we get a lot of snow anymore. But I do, um, I found a tumbler at Aldi for like 25 bucks and I keep it on my deck in the winter. So that's where my kitchen scraps go. And then in the spring, I can just add it all to the big pile too. So oh, yeah, you got options. <laughs> Okay. Are oak leaves good for compost? That's all we seem to have. <laughs> what what are they? Oak, oak leaves. leaves. Do you think they break down easily? Oh, and they'd be kind of acidic too, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think they would be as good as some others. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. If you look at like the oaks on the trees and the beech trees, a lot of them tend to keep their leaves throughout the season, like actually on the trees. So they, they persist a little bit longer. So they'd be harder to break down. So okay. thank you. Yeah. What about coffee grounds? Coffee grounds. I yeah, think I think you can, you can. They're good. Out. They're good for compost. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, Debbie. Yeah. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> oh, nice. Everything is, is good within limits, right? Everything in moderation, like we always say, right? Like you can exactly. add an orange peel, right? But you shouldn't just mm -hmm. add your orange peels to it, right? It's a little too acidic. Right. So. right. Yeah. Okay. And then consider covering your raised beds. Um, Jill, were you on when I, I gave you credit for all these ideas for the slides? Oh, no, but you didn't okay. have to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure you do. Um, but consider covering your raised beds. So um, if you have cardboard lying around and in the days of uh, Amazon, I don't know who doesn't have spare cardboard lying around, but um, you can put them on top of your bar, um, your beds. And here I found one that wasn't even raised beds. It's just this large area of land. But the, uh, Jill said the point of this is to stop early weeds from popping up and then to warm up the soil so that when you do go to plant, it kind of gives them a leg up. Then you can put compost down on top of this. And when it's time to plant, you don't even need to remove it. You just cut holes to the appropriate side of your plant and then put your plant right in there, right? Did I get the gist of that, Jill? You sure did. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done this with different like paper bags or paper packing that come in your Amazon or Chewy boxes mm -hmm. and lay down. Try to remember, though, to take off the tape from these boxes. Uh, we were digging up some cardboard that had broken down at Holden Elementary and the tape does not break down. There was a ton of tape under underneath the soil that we had to keep pulling out. But um yeah, if you use the cardboard, it keeps those weeds at bay while those plants are getting established. And if you can make it as close to the plant as possible, I like the cutting through idea in the past. I've put the plants in and laid the material around it and then held it down with compost and mulch. Okay. But I, I am going to do it this way this year. And um, hopefully it breaks down and, and makes it a lot a lot warmer underneath there anyway. You know, those baby roots need a little bit of warmth and protection. It seems a great way to cut down on the weeds and a, a better alternative to the, that like plastic mm -hmm. weed cover that you see a lot of times in the yards. Definitely. And this is something that's biodegradable. These boxes are breaking down and I, I've seen the effects of where they turn into some pretty nice rich black compost. Okay. So it's 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 a proven method. I I think this one's my favorite. I'd just like to add, we've done a lot of gardens like this in, in the area. And if you get a load of mulch from, from the city, you know, they always have pile, piles of mulch and then throw some wood chips on top of that. So you have some really good cover um, and then make a space to put your plants in. Uh, they seem to do really, really well. And like Jill said, the uh, cardboard does break down pretty fast and it just makes a really nice bed mm -hmm. okay. do you, you think that's doable in the the raised beds as well so the cardboard and then the would you say mulch and then wood chips oh yeah. i think you can do it anywhere yeah yeah mm -hmm. and sometimes in raised beds as lori knows because lori are all your garden beds out there raised beds not all of them but <laughs> i have about 12 raised beds of different heights and then I have one, we have one area that's in the ground. Okay, so you know how easy it is for the soil in there to get compacted. 
and bringing compost into there. Actually, in my opinion, I think it helps break up that, you know, adds that oxygen back down in there, causing pockets with the different things like that. Yeah, it, 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 compost does help uh, um, mulch, you know, even the, the wood chips or mulch. And like I keep, my mantra is those um, cover crops have made a huge difference in my raised beds. Just to keep that, that soil, it just stays so loose and so nice. Nice. Helps too. Great. I'm going to try that this year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So our, our next tip is to write it down. So I know the first year that I had my, my raised beds, I went into it blind and then I just threw in stuff where it fit and I did not write anything down. So the next year I didn't know what worked or what didn't work. So I felt like I was starting all over again, but um, I learned my lesson the hard way. So make sure you're keeping a plan to keep track of the space that you have. So it's good to know what you have in your garden from year to year. But also if you have it down and you know how much, what needs how much space, that really helps you from overbuying and impulse buying. My second year after I did not have the notebook, um, I had bought tomato plants and then I forgot I bought tomato plants. So I want, went and bought more tomato plants. And then my husband's aunt has a farm. So she gave me tomato plants and I ended up with 17 tomato plants, which mm -hmm. is too many <laughs> for two people. So luckily I know how to can. So it worked out, but it was still, I was, had tomatoes coming out of my ears. So that's <laughs> one of the reasons why I really suggest keeping um, a garden journal. So mm -hmm. um, obviously I don't think anyone keeps a garden journal as fancy as that picture I found, but <laughs> um, <laughs> the one on the right, I find would be more helpful if you're a, a visual learner, actually keeping a diagram of what you planted where is really helpful. So do any of our gardeners keep journals? I do. Yeah. It also helps me plan the next year because I try to rotate my crops in my raised beds. So it helps to remember where you put things. Yeah. Good. So the same reason why the farmers put down corn and then soy and alternate, right? We should be doing the same thing in ours as well, just alternating what we put in there. Anyone else have any tips of what you should include in your garden? I it's have it so I have garden journal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there are different things too about like uh, keeping your journal up to date Planting by certain times is something that you might even want to write in there of what date you actually planted. If any of you put in tomatoes last year, there was an early crop of tomatoes and a late crop of tomatoes because we had a very bizarre freeze that came through, if you remember. So people that were getting their tomatoes early planted before that freeze and somehow were able to protect their plants. And then after that freeze. So if you lost your plants during that big freeze, you might want to mark that down because I don't think our crazy weather is going to stop anytime soon. Back and forth, we've already seen it this year. So I planted after that because I'm usually late to the garden and I get tomatoes on through November. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm one of those that lost her tomato plants to the freeze. Uh, <laughs> right. So this year I'll do better. But I do, I keep track of when I start my seeds. You know, I keep track mm -hmm. of the dates when I do things. And yeah. I also keep a to-do list for the for the fall and the spring. Very nice. Like if I need to thin something out or move something, I just make a note of it so I don't forget. That's smart. It is very smart. And then it's always nice too if you write in your in your journal what kind of tomatoes you put in because sometimes they make mistakes at the nursery, and there were a lot of mistakes made uh, last year. I don't know what the reason was, but people were growing certain kind of peppers and they weren't the peppers they bought. Uh, nurseries were saying those don't look like the peppers that I ordered. So I, I saw that at a couple from a couple different angles. So if you had any tomato plants last year or pepper plants and they just didn't look like what you thought you were planting mm -hmm. they probably had made a mistake at the nursery and mixed them up so my mom was doing the same thing with her Mr. Stripey tomatoes and thought that they were the hillbillies because the color's just too close mm -hmm. so. okay 
Um, Jill's next tip was read the packaging, right? So they don't <laughs> put this stuff on there for their benefit. It's for ours. So I went down and I grabbed uh, mine. And um, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but Mark seems to have a very nice selection of organic seeds. Does anyone use Mark's plants? Where do you guys I, get your seeds from? Yep. I I have used Mark's. Uh, I've used, uh, you know, Mark's. I've used Walmart's. Yeah, whenever I see something in there, I grab them, usually flowers. Yeah, because I think for a long time, my I'll be the first to admit it, my garden was an afterthought, right? Because I was teaching, mm -hmm. so I usually didn't get my garden in until after the school year was over, and then I'd be at Mark's doing grocery shopping, and then I'd see their nice little display, so I grab yep. and they they come out fine, right? And I like that they do offer the organics. But the point is, on the back, they tell you all of this information, right? So when should you start planting? The days until germination, the depth at which you should put them in, how far you should, should space them, and if it's appropriate to start them indoors or out of doors. And that's, um, uh, Jane, to your point, it works for um, garden, vegetable gardens or flower gardens, right? Yeah. And I put a few important things on here, right? So according to Farmer's Almanac, the last spring frost is April 27th. I do believe they have a 30% chance of getting that wrong. And as we've seen this year, the weather is a little weird. Um, but as of right now, uh, the plant hardiness of Ravenna, and I keep picking Ravenna because that's where our mm -hmm. central office for the parks is located. But um, you could, of course, go on and look for your own when you type these things in. But Ravenna is a 6A. And then if you're right. a little bit east, it's a 6B, right? The color changes slightly. Um, right. So this will change. Uh, and I know that there were some uh, some areas closer to the lake that used to be like a 6B and they have been recharted as a 7A. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an interesting thing. I never saw them updated before. So while I was on this website with um, a lot of people that were making comments about that, I went back in and checked and, and yes, uh, Ravenna and Portage County are still in the 6A, considered 6A even though I believe we seem like a 6B at times, but that they base that off of uh, your freezing temperatures, how low your temperatures mm -hmm. actually go. So That's funny you mentioned that because I was just at a conference in Mansfield and, it, and the OSU professor was there. He's actually the, the state meteorologist or climatologist as well. And he was saying within the next 20 years, we're going to see lots of shifting in our plant mm -hmm. hardiness zones. So, yeah, and we're starting to see it already up towards the lake, which mm -hmm. I, I thought that was interesting. Right. Um, but for, for your seeds, just read on the back. You don't have to make it more difficult than it is. If you're going to start it indoors or outdoors, just um, I know the, the frost is hard to predict, but we do our best. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you all have to say about that? Do you like starting in seeds indoors versus outdoors? Do you have a preference or do you do a bit of everything? I do both. Mm -hmm. um, starting them indoors is kind of a pain. <laughs> it really is. It, it really is. is. Um, I'm I'm kind of a. I don't know what I, I do it kind of informally. I'm not as diehard about that as many gardeners are, uh, but I do like to get a head start on some things and my dahlia tubers, I start indoors. Mm -hmm. And then I now have a small greenhouse that my husband made for me. So I can take things outside in April and baby them in the greenhouse until they're ready to plant. So that helps a lot. Nice. Yeah. I know when I first started seeds, I was doing it in my basement and I, I learned very quickly that it's way too cold down there. So mm -hmm. the amount of effort I put into trying to get light sources and heat in the basement, I'm like this is not worth it. So <laughs> this depends if we on you know your space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did um, get one of those small indoor greenhouses, the one that just zip up the side from Drug Mart, I think, and I put it in my my back slider window, so it gets a nice amount of sunshine and gives them enough warmth to to warm up that way. So. I'm still starting seeds indoors. It's just not as big of a production. Sure. Well, that's a that's a good way to start. Mm -hmm. And hey, Polly. Yes. Um, I've been doing the last couple winters with like um like a milk jug, but I've had like 
I get distilled water from my humidifier. So I use that and I start, you know, you cut it in, in half, you know, the winter you seed have, sowing. Uh, what's that? The winter seed sowing. Yeah. So I've been starting um, milkweed and, you know, different native plants that way every winter. And it's, you know, been doing really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's um this is my first year I've tried it. So this this winter I tried it. So hopefully by the time spring comes, I'll have some. But if you're not familiar, what Wanda is talking about is winter seed sowing in milk jugs, where in January you cut your milk jugs, put some wet soil in and your native plants in there, and just put them outside because they're used to being in this freeze thaw price process that we're used to in northeast Ohio. Um we tried to offer a a program on it, but it did get um, snowed out. So usually I would look in January at the Portage Park District Education Calendar. We usually have a program on it, but it's usually um, pretty fruitful and you can get a lot of good, like you said, milkweeds and things like that um, started that way. Yeah. Anything that needs to be cold stratified. It's, it's kind of a nice way to protect it and know exactly where it's coming up at. And um, I, I've done the milk jug a, a few years. I feel like it's a lot of work. <laughs> so much work. You're cutting out your milk jugs. You have to make sure that all the milk is completely gone and that you've cleaned them with a bleach solution or else they can build a mold in there. It, there's so many things. And then taping them shut and marking them with what kind they are. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was going a little crazy. And maybe I should have done maybe a smaller batch and that would have been easier I cold stratify my seeds in the fridge I put them in a damp paper towel and I put them in the refrigerator set the Alexa app to remind me in 35 days and uh, then I can take them out and plant them lightly milkweed seeds especially don't like being deep in the soil they do really well on top of the soil with just the sprinkling of soil over top of them. Nice. So, um, but just something to remember too, when you are in, if you are planting your seeds, you know, inside and you're using heat mats or grow lights, the heat mats are for the seeds. The seeds need warmth. The plants need sunlight. So you don't need to have a sun lamp on your seeds and you don't need to have a heat mat under your plants. So switching those out is sometimes a chore, especially when those little ones, you know, have it all together, mm -hmm. you would still have to take off your dome once your plants are there because they need the light. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. I think we only have a couple slides left and we're about 10 minutes from eight. So we'll try to get these things wrapped up for you so you can enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, but another thing, if you have perennial plants uh, in your garden or in your yard, um, now would be the time to divide them. And I know hostas are not native, but I feel like everyone I know in Ohio has a hosta. <laughs> so it's just one of the things we all have. Um, so you would dig around them and then <laughs> break up the root system. And usually they suggest starting with your hand and being as gentle as possible. And I think we all reach the part where we're done being gentle and patient and you just kind of break it up. <laughs> and then you just go replant them somewhere else where they have a nice space, enough space and can move on from that. Um, I know things like irises, anything with like a, a bulb, right? Would need yeah. that kind of situation. Yeah. And you don't have to be all that careful, especially with hostas, yeah. because, yeah. Uh, you know, remember, get those tools sharpened, have a nice sharp tool. You can mm -hmm. just cut those all apart down in there and they'll won't even stunt them. Wait, good. Mm -hmm. okay. um, this is not prep, but it's just my own little... PSA, right? Um, mm -hmm. Plant your bird food. I know if you're into gardening, you're generally into birds too sometimes. So um, if you're tired of paying for bird feed, try consider considering planting your bird food. So put out the native plants that our animals have evolved with and they'll feed off of those things all summer long and then you'll have beautiful flowers as well. So. And that plant is cardinal flower, correct? Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. Then it always brings the hummingbirds in. So if you're trying to lure those birds into your yard, that one does work. Right. So why bother mixing up a sugar cocktail for the hummingbirds when you can just have this beautiful flower in your yard? So. Right. Okay. Any other tips, tricks? Did I miss it when you were talking about how important it is to get those tools sharpened? I did. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you're going to have sharpening at your Mother Day sale? 
Yes. Okay. Um, Debbie, do you know the exact hours of the the plant sale the Master Gardeners are doing out on Route 88? Well, we start at nine and I think we go officially until one, but we usually run out of plants by about what, 11, 1130, Lori? Or by noon. Yeah. By noon. Man. Lori said nine until we run out was the official right. time. Right. And we will have somebody there this year, correct? That will be. Um, yeah. Sharpening. I think Beth's husband's going to be there to sharpen tools. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Lori, did I you. I will bring anything? mine. Oh, good. Did you want to share more about cover cropping? No, I think we've talked, we talked quite a bit about it. Okay, yeah. good. Were there any questions before we wrap up? Hi, Angel. <laughs> um, I want to answer your questions first, and then I'll give my little other thing. <laughs> any questions? Okay, if you're thinking on those, keep thinking. I just want to share this before we leave. But there are some great webinars. Um, the Northeast Ohio Pollinator, Pollinator Society, which is through OSU, is great. And they do a winter webinar series on planting. So you can go to their website and you can watch all of the recordings. You can click those. And then I just got this email today. The Nature Conservancy with the OSU Extension is coming up with a Gardening for Conservation Extension webinar series. And they're doing pretty much everything we've been talking about, right? There's um, homegrown conservation, there's planting food for conservation, there's how to deal with pests, bugs, and mammals in your backyard. So I'm really looking forward to that. And that's gonna run April through September. So there'll be um, webinars all year long. Um, yeah. I, I don't I'll know you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Holly. No, you're good. I was just going to say, I, I know at least when I was teaching, I get um, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So <laughs> I don't know about you, but I get tired of watching so many Zooms. But <laughs> these I have found are worth it, <laughs> especially I'm looking forward to this gardening for conservation one. And if you have, if you have Zoom fatigue or you don't want to use the computer to find those things, the Master Gardeners will be opening up their helpline here in, I believe it's April. April so 1st. You, April 1st. Thank you. And you can call, you can email. Um, do you have a, is that the link? I, put, I, I put the link in the chat. So the link is in the chat. So if you're saying, what should I plant? Um, where should I plant it? Why is this dying? Why do I keep planting the same thing in the same spot over and over and over and it keeps dying? Uh, they might have some tips for you. And they, so any questions that you have, please, you know, that's a free service that the Master Gardeners offers to our community. So any questions that you have, um, also our office has, uh, the Depart Department of Agriculture does the Victory Garden seed packets. So I think Seth is going to announce he has those soon so that you could come into the extension office and pick up Victory Garden seed packets. I think it has sunflowers, carrots, it has a, like a sampling of, of seeds. So if you're looking for free seeds, um, few of our local libraries are now carrying seed libraries. We have the Kent Free, um, the Reed Memorial, uh, the one up in Garrettsville, and the one in Wyndham. All are carrying seeds. There may be more, but those are the ones that I'm sure of that have a seed library where you can go check out seeds, plant them. All they ask in return is that you bring back some dried seeds in the fall and, and help them replenish that library. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Does anyone have any questions before we log off? Um, I took some notes and I took pictures of the chat. So I'll send a follow-up email with all of these links for you to look. I do want to say thank you to Jill from OSU and all of our master gardeners, especially Lori and Debbie that helped out. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm.